What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I am super excited about today's guest, Chris Gandy of Midwest Legacy Group. I will introduce you to him in a second. Check out other episodes of the podcast. Uh, I had Pat Williams. Uh, Pat Williams, if you don't know, brought the Orlando Magic to Orlando. He went door to door selling season tickets so he could bring the team there. He was played an integral part of NBA history, helping draft Charles Barkley, Shaq, Um, Don Yeager, also an 11-time New York Times bestseller, has some amazing books about athletes, coaches, John Wooden, Walter Payton, Michael Jordan. You'll see why this relates to today's interview in a second. Um, But before I do, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. We help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and relationships in general because we help you run your podcast. And You know, Chris, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships. And podcasting has been amazing to profile some of my favorite people that I admire, like you and other business leaders on my podcast. And shout out to the world that people should be checking out what you're talking about, what you're doing. So if you've thought about starting a podcast, go to rise25.com. We've been doing it since 2008 and helping many, many companies uh, all over the United States and world. Um, today's guest, Chris Gandy is founder of Midwest Legacy Group and Chris has spent the, he has an amazing background in history. He's spent the last two decades helping individuals reach their most important financial goals. Um, in 1989, Chris started his own financial services practice and since then has traveled the U S working with athletes, key executives and minorities. And his firm focuses on unique tax reduction strategies retirement, income optimization, generational wealth, and so much more. He actually, his background, he played at the University of Illinois Fighting Illini basketball team where he was co-captain. After college, Chris played professionally for the Chicago Bulls, San Antonio Spurs, and in France. And he's been featured in numerous magazines, Crane Chicago, GQ, Black Enterprise, African American Career World, and he serves on multiple boards as well. I don't know how you have time for all this, Chris. Chicago Concussion Coalition, the Urban League, and he serves on the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors National Committee for Diversity and Inclusion Task Force and is the youngest one serving on the national board. Chris, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Doc. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to to share these wonderful ideas, you know, fantastic um, history and and, uh, hopefully a couple key nuggets that uh, people take away from our dialogue today and hopefully they implement and use um, to be more efficient in where they're trying to go and and uh, what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and I, I, there's so much I want to ask you. We will talk about some of the major issues that executives have and how you help executives and even how to take advantage during COVID and protect your assets and um, I love, we, we, before we hit record, you were telling me the 10 things you didn't know if you're working with someone who's African American. And I think that that is really important in general and, and the reception you got from talking about those things has been amazing. But I want to start early on your career because what has shaped you and is sports. And because I love when you talk about um, Sports is, an, is a basically a reference and analogy for so many things in leadership and business. Um, when you were growing up, Chris, 
What did you want to be when you grew up? Did you knew you wanted to be a basketball player? Uh, no, actually, um, it's, it's interesting if you rewind the tape a little bit. Um, I was, when I was growing up, I actually was a, um, uh, was a track kid. So I played, uh, I ran track and uh, had an opportunity to, 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 to do well at that. I was, a, uh, was the 800, 800 relay guy, was a 400 relay guy, ran the 400 stretch, and then also did high jump. So I was good. I didn't want to do much more than that. And um, then I found a love for baseball. Baseball was always one of those things when you were young. Uh, we would sit around, big league chew, and always wanted to be like uh, – you know, Andre Dawson, right? You remember that name, right? So I totally. always wanted to be like an Andre Andre Dawson type of guy, right? And uh, we would we would go out and uh, play stickball, right? When people used to do that and play wiffle ball until the dark until it got dark, and your mother would would say something like, "Don't let the don't let the um, the street lights catch you coming home," right? So had a fantastic uh, youth growing up, just quite frankly being a kid and. Um, then someone said one day, they said, hey, you should, you should consider playing basketball. You know, your uncles played basketball. You know, my uncle played basketball actually in college. He went on to play Juco basketball and then went on to play at a small D1 school or D2 school. Um, my uncles played uh, – my other uncle played football. My other uncle so, – so from a fairly athletic family. Um, uh, again, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. So it just led me down the path of saying, Hey, let's play basketball. But the first time I played basketball, I said, I never want to play basketball again. So why? Um, but because people told me I couldn't do it, you know, you'll never be able to do it just because you're tall started this, this uh, addiction that I would say that I have towards competition. And that is if someone tells me I can't do something, I say to them, well, if there's a 1% chance, if there's a 0.1% chance of us being able to accomplish it, I want to take that one, you know, point one percent chance, and and that's kind of how we 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 operate. Is is, is we don't believe in anything's impossible. But we believe in everything's possible and everything's probable, given the right mindset, given the right obstacles ahead of us, and given the right opportunity to succeed at it. Um, and we try to instill that in our clients, even if they're starting late with planning retirement, planning late. They have people on the team. They've been doing this for 20, 25 years. Many a times we'll encounter clients that have what I call the, the financial junk drawer, which is everybody has a junk drawer at home. If you don't, then, <laughs> and you don't live here in the United States or you just moved, right? The junk drawer is where you put everything and you say, okay, when I get to it, you know, I'll go through that drawer and I'll clean it up. That financial junk drawer is where we help people organize and organizing people's actions and intent so we can ultimately align ourselves to be more efficient and effective. And that's what I believe sports has allowed for us to do is to allow people to build game plans, the true X's and O's of how to, 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 to win on a regular basis versus just win once or win twice or have a good year, have a bad year, or be uncertain about the outcome of the game. We got one chance to play this game and we want to win on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm going to go back to going into college in a second, but what do you find, Chris, what are in people's financial junk drawers? when you start to peel back the layers? So um, I talk about the bread, car, the, the, uh, bread, car, bread crumbs, and the bread crumbs are typically things that we've accumulated over time, right? So I'll give you an example. When we first come out of college, we'll say, hey, yes, we want to pay down debt, and we want to actually build our credit, and we want to do these things, and we're going to start our first retirement account at this company. Why? Because my mom told me it's a good thing to do and they matched my money and things like that. Oh, maybe I'll start a Roth IRA, things like that, just things like that. And then over time, what happens is that as we progress and we get better with our careers, our plans, unfortunately, don't do the same. We think they do, but they don't. And, and, and different phases of life require us to take a step back and refocus differently on what we, need to, what we need to be doing. So in their junk drawer, we'll see three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Last year I had 14 different retirement accounts that we had to actually organize and put together because compound interest is our friend. So we like the idea of money growing and compounding on a consistent basis. So we had to do that. And then, um, but we'll see things like that. We'll see things like we had a plan or we started a plan, I mean, risk management insurance, we started a plan you know, 10 years ago and we've never to revisit it. And it's so like, you start to say, hmm, 
Has your life changed? Has the outcome changed? Do you still actually need what you had before? Because isn't it nothing more than the gap between your assets and what you really want if something happens to you, right? And then ultimately, we get to the end of the, of, of the race and we say, how long do you want to be paying for this? Does this, does, does this plan still match your objective or wherever you're, where you're going? I mean, think about that. Think about that, Doc, right? You and I are going to get in a car and you, are, you and I are going to go down, we're going to head towards Florida, right? And we're, we're halfway to Florida and you say, yeah, you know, um, we really should be going towards California, right? Are you just <laughs> going to drive to Florida anyways because it's just fun to do? Or are you going to say, you know what, let's turn around now and we still have a chance of getting to California um, within a reasonable amount of time? Well, the odds are I would hope that you would turn around. Not that I'm, I'm stopping the car and putting you out, but um, we would – we would turn around and we like, would I'm going, towards, you got to get out of here. No. Yeah. We, we would head towards Florida and that's where we hear, hear people and we see people have to readjust because their life, the circumstances of their life have changed. Think about it. When we, when we educate our children, our children are no longer our largest liability is when our children are underneath our, our household. And once those children are no longer underneath our household, our debt, our long-term debt obligation drops. Right. So the question becomes then about quality of life and legacy. It doesn't become about how do I make sure the family is taken care of? How do I make sure education is paid for? How do I make sure that that if I'm not here, my replacement of my income, how do I make sure that if I can't work, my income is continued? How do I make sure that my business continues during at least the time frame which my kids are in school and they're at home and they're underneath my roof and it's my responsibility? So those risks change. And unfortunately, people don't adjust along the way. Interest rates change. Investments change. Everything changes over time. And unfortunately, people just don't adjust along the way. Yeah. I could totally see, Chris, that if someone doesn't have a cohesive plan, they just start picking up things through the different decades of their life. And then at the end, there's this just conglomerate of stuff that just doesn't go together. Um, yeah. And... So we'll talk about the CEOs, executives, and, and even, you know, the type, you know, you've athletes and, and other people who you work with to help with um, the whole wealth management and cohesive plan. But back to high school going to college. So people are saying, I don't know if you could play. You're like, I'm competitive. I'm going to make this happen. Um, when you were a senior in high school, uh, how tall were you? And were you going, were you thinking of going to play basketball at that time, like college wise? Yeah. So um, if we just go back about three, let's go back six years from there. Right. So um, I started playing basketball. My first time out was my sixth grade year in, 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 in grade school. That was my first opportunity to play basketball. And I played basketball and actually we, I, there was a team that um, you didn't get cut from the sixth grade team, no matter how, how good you were. So I went out to play basketball. They put me on the B team. They used to call them the B team bombers. Okay. And uh, my problem was that I could not gauge how far the basket was or how hard to shoot the basketball um, to actually make it go in. You know, touch. I didn't have it, right? I've never played this thing, right? I'm used to throwing baseballs as hard as you can, run as fast as you can, jump as high as you can, not used to trying to finesse a basket, a ball into a, a rim. So I would often shoot the ball either too hard and it would be what they call AKA a brick, right? Meaning go look it up, right? I think it's, um, I think it's uh, slang or, or terminology on the, on the uh, basketball courts where, where you hit nothing but the rim, nothing but glass or nothing <laughs> but the backboard. You don't touch any rim. That's considered a brick, right? Um, and you may take somebody's head off under the basket or something like that because you shot the ball too hard. So um, I was that kid. And so they would bring me off the bench probably with a minute to go in the first half and 30 seconds to go in the second half. They say, hey, go in there. If anybody comes in there, put your hands up and just jump and maybe block a shot or something. If you get a rebound, get rid of it right away. But if you get the ball right under the basket, shoot it, right? So I remember that. And so that was my – the B-team bombers is what we used to be called. And so that's what my skill set allowed for me to do. Um, well, I continued to work at it because I'm one of those people that I don't want people to be better than me. So if somebody else can do it, I can do it. So I would mimic behaviors of what I saw other people doing. And I would just memorize that 
uh, physically and mentally. I would teach my body how to memorize certain moves. Even if I could not do the move, I would memorize what step. I would slow down. I'd, re I'd tape things, and I would, I would slow it down, tape it, and then I would go out, and I would learn those footworks, those steps, so those things like that. By my seventh grade year, I actually made the A team. Um, I made the A team, and actually I wasn't a starter, but I actually played enough at that time to get better. And then that summer, I just worked my tail off. Um, I went to a place called Pioneer Park in Kankakee, which is um, probably the, um, uh, we'll call it the ghetto of Kankakee. And uh, it's where basically you learn how to play, right? And so I was tall, but I wasn't the tallest on my team. And pretty much they told me, they said, if you want to play here, you know, you got to get down and dirty. So every, every day I would just go out and play 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 and mimic those moves and play and play. But now I'm playing with guys in their 40s, 30s, and 40s that have been playing a long time, right? So the moves that they were doing on the playground were way more advanced than people were in high in grade school, and even high school. So now I go back my eighth grade year, and now they're like, okay, who's this kid, <laughs> right? This kid can actually actually play. As a matter of fact, I was, I was athletic enough that I could jump up and actually somehow uh, maybe grab the rim and throw the ball off the glass and maybe it go in and they, they call it a dunk, right? Maybe. Um, but my coach told me, unless you can make sure you do it, don't ever do it. So I, I never got a chance to do it in high in, in grade school, but you know, I average, you know, 10 to 11 points uh, in, in, in grade school, but I, I still was young. And then that just kept progressing. Uh, by the time I was a freshman, um, I continued to, to baptize myself and just punishment out on the playground <laughs> And uh, came back my freshman year and uh, made the varsity team, but I was a freshman kind of phenom at that time, and uh, played varsity on Friday nights. And then um, I always got uh, 20 minutes, so whatever I played in the varsity game. And again, I was off the bench, so I was like one of the last guys to come in towards the uh, what they call junk time. So that was me. And then by my uh, sophomore year, again, I um, I went to a camp and came back, big man camp. Went to big man camp, came back, and then I was the man on campus. So, How tall were you at the time, sophomore? Six seven. Six seven. Six, seven. Okay. Yeah, yeah, six seven. I was super athletic, forty two inch vertical. Jump out the gym, go. I can go get it right and um, learn how to shoot a jump shot for a big guy. So that was rare. Still couldn't dribble, but I, I had enough footwork around the basket and I could jump over the basket. And literally, I had a jump shot. Those are the three things I needed to go to college. So, worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. By my junior year, I was actually playing with the junior college down in, in Kankakee. Um, that's where I practiced, and I come play with my team on Thursday and Friday. And then from there, I was uh, I was a high, I was one of the top recruits in high school coming out. I was in the top 100. I think I was number 62 or something like that. And then I made it to the top 20, and the rest was history, right? And so. It just goes to show that hard work pays off. You know, your intent, uh, where I started and where I ended, it were two different, two different journeys. Um, but none of it was because we didn't work hard, right? Yeah. And so um, it's not what I intended to do, but it was what I needed to do to move past that chapter in, in my life and give me the – and instill in me some of the tools necessary uh, to, to have some success in my life. Yeah. And Chris, what's interesting is, and I want to hear uh, a couple of your favorite MBA stories, but you saw firsthand as far as, you know, you help people with wealth management, cohesive plans, and you probably saw sometimes the other end of the spectrum in sports. Um, when you were in, you know, GQ magazine, you and Doug Glanville talked about this, about, you know, athletes not managing their money properly. Okay? Correct. Correct. So you saw us in that firsthand, I imagine. Correct, correct. So, so um, you know, we, we do do a lot in the athlete and entertainment space. It's fun. It reminds me, it keeps me youthful. It keeps me uh, full of youth. It reminds me that, um, uh, you know, money, money that people have doesn't come. And when it comes by accident or it comes because of a gift that you possibly have, it may not mean the same as somebody who's, 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 who's worked their tail off for it for 20 or 30 years and has the same thing. Um, so um, I did see, you know, and, and it's constantly, you hear it all the time. You hear athletes going broke, athletes losing money, athletes getting taken advantage of, things like that. Um, 
my goal was when I got done was I wanted to give back. That was my way of giving back. I didn't want to go into coaching. I wanted to actually be one of those people that actually help players uh, just navigate the, 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 the world of, of, uh, of, of sports, um, but the business of sports, not necessarily being their agent, not necessarily being an, you know, a coach, not that, but the business of sports, there's more money made outside of the court than made inside the court, which people don't understand right? Sports is a billion dollar business, right? And so um, the owners of the basketball teams can afford to pay LeBron James, you know, $40 million a year, which means that they're making more than $40 million a year, right? Uh, they're making way more than $40 million a year. And people don't understand that. All they see is, man, LeBron James makes $40 million a year. Well, is the owner making $400, $400 million a year? I mean, okay, that's 10% of what he makes. That's not a bad investment. If he's going to make him $400 million. So um, we saw a lot of, we see a lot of that. Actually, we saw a lot of that. We continue to see a lot of it um, where agents will be in a position or agents may, may um, introduce uh, players to, to people that um, they, they, they think are favorable. But the problem with that is this simple, is that unless you've walked in the shoes and you understand what it's like, a player's retirement is not like you and I's retirement. Is not like the retirement of someone who's worked for 30 years at, at, um, at, a, at a large company. It's not the same retirement. Their retirement is you're going to make a lot of money over a short period of time. And then based on whatever skill sets you have or you've established at that point, that then will balance itself out and that will become your new income. So people go through that culture shock. And it's the same way with uh, we work with um, some settlement winners. And there's a book out there called Sudden Wealth. If you've never heard of it, you should, you, should, you should get it. So people that sell companies, I give them this book, and I say Sudden Wealth, and it says it talks about what happens in the brain mm. when you've, that you've been oppressed from something for so long, and then you get it. There's a dopamine that goes through the brain that makes you feel like you're invincible, and money, unfortunately, rep, uh, represents this power that it doesn't really have. So we give it this power in society that it doesn't really have because, you know, I've never seen a dollar bill walk across a table. I've never seen it open a door and be kind to other people. I've never seen it cry for other people, but I've seen people do those things for that. So um, we try to put it into some sort of context and give it some sort of uh, identification. So it does not, it does not qualify their lives. And so then they can disconnect from it. Because until then, it's their power. So I only love when that. you can disconnect it. Only when you can disconnect the, the power from the money, then you have an opportunity to really help those guys understand that this is something, this is, this is stored labor, and this is only for a period of time. So your retirement's going to look a little differently than everybody else's. I will definitely check out Sudden Wealth. Chris, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, I have not heard good. of it. Really um, you know, in that article, um, they talk in the article that you're in, they talk about somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of athletes in the NBA and NFL go bankrupt within five years of retirement, which was, was every time I hear it, it still shocks me, right? And they talk about despite making an average of over $5 million. Um, sure. And what was interesting about the article and what you and Doug talked about was speed is a really big factor in this. So I'm wondering if you talk about, you probably talk to athletes and, and other people. What are the mistakes that you see them making that you're saying, listen, be on the lookout for this and speed stuck out. I didn't even realize that was such a big factor. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about what, what is the factor of speed with, the mistakes that, that the athletes make? Well, I mean, it's, it's, if you if you just kind of, let's sim let's simplify the concept is that the, the timeline in which they make this money is just like that. Right. And in, in comparison to the rest of their life, I mean, really let's do the math, right? Let's say you play professional basketball, even, Let's say you play college basketball because college basketball is a professional sport. You just don't get paid to do it. You get a scholarship or whatnot, right? So, so let's just say over, over even if you redshirt, let's say call it five years, 
right? Let's say five years in college, and then the average NBA player will use an NBA player because typically their life, their life, their professional life is longer than than the actual um, than boxing or football. Football is a little shorter than that. But let's say you pay, play another three years. Um, five years is a gift, but the average is two and a half years for basketball, right? So let's say you, you play five years and you play five years in college because you're redshirted. That's 10 years, right? The average life expectancy is 76 and a half for a male. So what percentage of that life of your life are you actually, quote unquote, making revenue from basketball, <laughs> yeah. right? And Not much. much, much it's, it's a very, 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 very small percentage. And then if we just count professional sports, it's even a smaller percentage right and it's and typically it's less than 10 percent of their overall lifetime and so when you take 10 percent of someone's overall lifetime and try to make it expand over an entire lifetime those numbers are small you divide it out the numbers are super small and so that is the challenge with 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 with, with sports it does not give them the opportunity for success long term because it doesn't force them to have to create wealth later on it doesn't force them to have to do anything and most people that make five millions live like they make six most of the athletes because when because when the plane stops the lifestyle doesn't and that's a whole nother conversation but we won't get into that but you know the lifestyle doesn't stop because most athletes are pretty pretty proud most of them are pretty you know a personality most of them are pretty good at what they do right so the last thing they want people to do is feel like they failed and again, that's a psychological thing because again, it's tied to what they perceive people want them to be versus who they really are. So, so the athletes are always fun. And I, I, I've actually said um, often that the world in which I live is that I look for the professional athlete in the corporate world. So people that are, 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 are superstars that in their own, in their own space like physicians, we do a lot with the physician markets because again, they work hard, play hard, get taxed a lot, have wonderful lifestyles. And at the end of the day, someone's always trying to sue them for money, right? So there's, there's, the, there's the physicians. And then you have the executives, which are the same type of people. And then you have the CEOs or the entrepreneurs. You have the same type of people. You have the CEOs, they're the same type of people. Being unique, being different, allows for you if you're the if you're the king of the jungle right in your own space or in your own world you're big fish in a small pond then you have to do things a little bit differently and so our 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 experience has been that we can relate to those individuals who feel like you know what my thing's a little bit different because of all the the the, the means and all the opportunities that i'm getting how do i make sure that all this is moving in the right direction to really help me optimize my opportunity. And who doesn't want to be operating at the optimal performance level? I'm, I'm not sure. So there's, you have found there's what are three, four, five, six or more major issues that executives have. Um, so I'd love for you to talk about that and then how you help the executives. Sure, let's, let's, let's talk about the top five. Right, because there's a bunch of them that kind of swirl and they kind of intermingle between, between them all. But the number one issue I think executives have is simply uh, reverse discrimination. You may say, Chris, reverse discrimination. Well, how does that work? Well, well, um, the actual 401ks, retirement plans, qualified plans, whatever you want to call them, the typical pre-tax retirement plan is, is only, only gives you a certain percentage of your income that you can put away. So if I'm making half a million dollars and I can put $19,000 into my 401k, what kind of planning is that really for me? But people will tell me, Chris, my 401k is my retirement plan. But what most people don't even understand is the 401k was a supplement to a retirement plan because it was a supplement to the pension in which it was built. If you go back and read the actual act, a 401k was actually designed to be a supplemental plan. Not to give you 100% of your income, it was designed to only give you 20 to 30% of your income in retirement. But again, people don't understand the science and the math and they don't understand the data. So what we try to do is we use data to continuously show people, here are the facts. You can disagree with Chris Gandy all you want, but the facts are the facts. Your 401k was designed to be a supplemental retirement plan. It was not designed to be your retirement plan. Your 401k is a retirement product, right? Your retirement plan is 
Where do I take my money from? How do I continue to make it grow? How do I make sure it, that I, I'm, it's actual tax, tax favorable? How do I make sure that it's complementary to my other things that I have going? So, so we see that. We also see that the set it and forget it. That's number two. Number, number two, set it and forget it. That doesn't work anymore, right? Before you used to work a long time and you, you know what, they give you a gold watch, give you a pension, say, God bless, goodbye, we'll take care of you the rest of your life and we'll take care of your wife the rest of her life if you're married. That's not, they don't do that anymore. Right. Ninety nine percent of pensions are all but dried up or frozen. Right. There's a handful of a few occupations that still have them. But that means that the onus falls back on the employee. And if I'm limited on how much I can put into my quote unquote retirement plan. Right. That means that I have to create other strategies to get there. And unfortunately, that information is not readily available to the general public. So that's, that's, that, that's a problem. So that's number two. The set it and forget it is out the door. Just, let's just throw that one out the door, right? Number three is every time I have a chapter in my life, I have to prepare for the next chapter. See, part of the preparation, imagine this, I go to practice and we don't talk about the game plan until the day we show up at the game. That doesn't make any sense. So I tell everybody, we're in the chapter right now is preparation for the next chapter. And where we are in the next chapter of our life, we're either going to be there and be prepared or it's going to be a surprise. Which would you rather have? Totally. Right. So we're, we're in preparation for our next chapter of our life, right? If we're, out, we're in our last 10 years of working for retirement, we're not really working to, to get to retirement. We're actually preparing for our, our retirement distribution. That's what we're actually preparing for. We can't wait till we get to the top of the mountain to call in a helicopter to say, oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot this. I need this for the rest of my life. That's not how it works. You got to prepare as you go and you got to take those materials up the mountain along the way. So that's, that's also, uh, last uh, four and five are, are pretty simple is our plans don't complement each other, right? So their actions and intent don't align with each other. So I call it the alignment, right? And so think of it like this, you're a chiropractor, you know, this, you, you, you are in the medicine medical world, You've seen people that come in and they're out of alignment, right? And what happens when they're inefficient in their alignment? It's uh, not up, you know, their body's in function, they get pain, they have all sorts of issues. Exactly. So think of it from a financial perspective. When we're out of alignment, right, we have a tendency to A, not get to where we want to go, B, have pain along the way that we didn't realize we even had, and C, we have to take corrective measures to try and adjust and fix them, right? So in those situations, their actions aren't aligned with their intent. I hear people say, Chris, I wanna retire in five years. Okay, here's the percentage of this you need to save of your income. Well, I don't know if I can do that, that that's too much. I'm like, what? <laughs> you told me, you said to me, I didn't say to you, you said my intent is I would like to retire in five years with this much income. Here is the number to help you get there based on what you told me is important to you. So either A, it's not that important, or B, the, 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 actually, the things you need to sacrifice to actually do that is, 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 is pressing on you more and more important to you than the inconvenience of giving up that, 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 that money. So, so again, that's, we see that alignment Actions and intent don't align with each other. Um, and last but not least is people, um, our executives, unfortunately, is um, they forget to have that connection with their vitamin. I mean, really, we coach people, and you got to have that relationship. you got to build that relationship with people because they have to trust us, and we have to trust them. And what I mean by trust them is, is everybody can't be on the right team. You got you got Everybody deserves the opportunity to, 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 to retire and live a great quality of life. The problem is they rely on their companies to provide all their benefits for them. And then when they retire, they're like, oh, I got to figure this out now. And you start to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if you would have been prepared before we got to this point? And so we'll start to bring up things that they definitely don't see as potholes along the way that definitely we'll need to actually address as we go along. And that's what we have a tendency to do. So those are the five, I mean, I have 10, but those are the five that I think everybody on listening to your podcast today, if they went down, check, 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 check. If you're 90% on that, you're like, okay, I'm good. But if you're at about 50, 
it may, may be time to actually just reanalyze, kind of see am I in alignment? And as I tell everyone, I don't know if I can help you or not. I don't. Only way I know if I can help you is most of the time we end up complimenting other advisors or enhancing what people already have in place. And who doesn't want to actually get to where they want to go that much faster? Example, Doc, if I told you, hey, based on your current plan, you can retire at 65, but if we just made this tweak or this tweak, you can be done at 61. Why would you not consider that? Sounds good to me. Other than the inconvenience. Yeah. Talk about that for a second, Chris. Um, you know, the same goes for sports, right? To get to be at the level you're playing at, you have to make sacrifices. You have to okay. do things that other people are not willing to do. You have to show up and you have to play more. You have to practice. You, look, you have to look at game tape. You have to do all those things. What are some of the things that you've seen, you know, some of the clients that you've made recommendations to So, listen, if you want to get here, if you want to retire by here and, and live the same lifestyle, here's some of the sacrifices you're going to have to make now for that. And not everyone's going to do it. Not everyone's going to listen in general. But what are some examples of sacrifices you've seen people make? And then so they you know, can come out the way they want on the other side. Yeah. Um, one of some of the major sacrifices is that, that when, 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 people in their, when children are no longer at home, people are willing to give up whatever it takes to get what they want. Um, for some reason, when our kids are home and you know, we're, we're, we're taking care of them. We have a tendency to say, well, we'll just wait. Right. Um, so, so, so we see a lot of that. We also see a lot that uh, people aren't taking advantage of a lot of the new tax laws and tax rules that allow for us to be able to leverage that, to be able to enhance and buffer our retirement opportunities. Right. So they typically forget about that because they haven't been doing the research and reading the data we've been reading the white papers and the data and I was actually part of what you said is the national association of insurance and financial advisors. Um, I was actually on Capitol Hill when they voted on part of the, uh, the change that you saw come out in normal society where now you can actually um, wait on taking RMDs from your retirement plan. So if you didn't weren't taking them at 70 and a half, you can actually wait till 72. Well, that didn't just come out of nowhere. That actually came from a actual, our committee, um, which is the, the association. So a lot of the retirement changes that you've seen, the increases that came from a lot of that came from our committee. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we get up privy to where we kind of know it's coming um, before it actually hits the streets, what we call Main Street America. So um, we educate our clients in advance. Here are some of the things that we need to definitely talk about because it's going to be changing. Example, now qualified plans. If you got four companies, they can get together. They don't even have to work in the same institution. Before they used to have to have the same tax ID number. Now four companies can literally, they're all strangers, can come together and say, we want to have one retirement plan for the cost of, for the purpose of saving money, right? That's never been done before. So that was one of the things that they started to do when they started to consolidate some of the plans. Even the states now are offering retirement plans. Um, how, many, how, many, how many registered representatives or how many licensed professionals did the state hire that I don't know about? None, right? But they have a plan, right? So, so there's a lot of options. The problem is there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of information on the internet. And people believe if you just Google, Google is, Google is the new Bible, right? If you Google it, then that's the actual fact. But we all know that 70% of stuff on, 50% of the stuff on Google or 40 or some, some crazy number is just people's opinion, <laughs> which is really kind of interesting because people believe that it's the Bible, right? You got to do your research. You got to do your fact checking. Um, you got to do your due diligence to make sure that, that those facts are actual real facts versus just someone's opinion. Um, now, I got to buy Amazon today. No, you don't. You don't have to, and especially if it doesn't fit your objective. I mean, I don't understand. Just because it's a cool thing to do and everybody's saying do it. Because Susie Orman screaming at the screen or Kramer screaming, sell, buy, blah, 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 or Dave Ramsey says no debt. You know, these are what I call celebrity advisors. And people will use that and say, well, this is the absolute way and the only way to build wealth. Well, we all know that there's a one size fits all. Doc, think about it like this right? I came to see you. Before you ever examined me, you just prescribed me, hey, give him 200 milligrams of uh, uh, tratiloroswin and uh, send him out the door. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't even tell you what was wrong. I really just had a headache, you know, when I came to see you. But no, no, no. Chris, this is our one fix for everybody. 
it's guaranteed to fix everything in the world, regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of how much debt you have, regardless of what's going on, regardless of the pain, guaranteed. How often would people come see you? It reminds me of my big fat Greek wedding where they're like, yeah, just spray in Windex on it. It'll cure everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Chris, you've, you've talked to organizations and groups, and one of the things you've talked about are the 10 things you need to know if you're working with someone who's African-American. Uh, you yeah. don't have to go through all 10 fun. of them, but, but, but talk about a few of those. So I think, I think what's happened because of COVID, and I'll just speak to this. I'll, I'll speak to this because it's, it's, it's really a passion of mine. Because of COVID, I, I believe that people have started to realize that the world in which we, the business world in which we've been in recently and the business world in which we've kind of grown into, um, it's the institution of it has been um, disproportionately um, oppressive to, to many cultures, right? And so, and so, opportunities have not been given a fair opportunity at times have not been given to people that are as good or even better than others who have gotten an opportunity because of that. So, so it's allowed for me to kind of talk through that a little bit and just have what I call a, a, a very understanding conversation because, you know, just because you and I may look different, it's not your fault. Right. But the system around us, um, has to change if we want it to be different. And so I think, unfortunately, the minorities in America have blamed, hey, we're gonna blame white America. And Hispanics have said, hey, we're gonna blame everybody else. And everybody's blaming every, everybody else. But you and I talked about this before. As I said, I think we are actually creating the reverse of what we really want to happen. You know, the stereotypes that are existing because we're putting people in categories now. And, and again, here's a great example of that. Everybody put, a, put the police in a category when they saw that there was uh, too much aggression happening in a video of someone dying on TV, right? And they kept playing it over and over and over. And I said to myself and my son, I said, can I tell you something? There's nothing positive that would ever come of that. So why are they still playing that other than to put fuel on the fire, right? I mean, other than to put fuel on the fire of what's happening or to get ratings, one or the two. As it ratings make the most sense because follow the money, right? It's a money thing, right? If we have the first one to break the news, we have the first one to show it over and over and over and over and over. Hey, turn to CNN, you can see it, right? It's, you know, that type of thing. But the problem with that is it, it then in turn made a culture, right? Feel a certain way and then take that aggression out on another culture and then everybody became these, these, these very divisional stereotypes, right? The police officers, right? You realize there's black, white, Hispanic police officers, right? So how did the police officers become a color? They did, right? But all of a sudden they did, they became a color. Like if you're a police officer, so you saw actually black police officers fighting with black protesters saying, you're not one of us. I'm like, what? Like, that's what makes it like, do you, do you not look at me? Like, I don't understand. Like, what is, what is, I have to turn this off because it created the wrong narrative. And I think the narrative that we should have been having and the narrative that should have been talked about is that, yes, there's been overarching force for police and there's been, there's been things happening in certain cultures that's never been talked about or realized because of yeah, those things have been going on for 20, 30 years. It hasn't, that's nothing new, right? Just because it's now you can video and tape it, it's not new that it's happening though. So, so you asked me the question because I, I wanted to kind of start with that. So I've been on a lot of calls and I think people are afraid to engage in that conversation, but I'm not, right? So, so I, I represent diversity, but I also represent some of my best friends are white, Hispanic, women, LGBT, right? So, so I can have the right conversation because of where it's coming from. So. Here are five things that if you have African Americans as, as 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 friends as clients, here's what I'd recommend that you don't do. Right. The first thing is count your friends. Right. Yeah, I got five. I got five African American friends. Don't ever do that again, please. That's that's just a no no. <laughs> right. Because think about it. You don't count how many white friends you have. You don't count how many Hispanic friends you have. You don't count how many Chinese friends you have. You don't do that. So why all of a sudden would you count other friends you have 
if they're your friend, they're your friend, regardless of the color or the race or their skin or the pigment in their skin, they can't control that. So, so number one, don't do that. So yeah, I got five black friends. Like what? No, you don't do that. Right. <laughs> Just think about how, how simplistic that is. Right. You don't count your friends. In fact, I think I got eight friends and they're the segments, right? Cause now all of a sudden indirectly you're segmenting people. You're creating classifications for people that, live, breathe, and eat the same thing we, right? So, so that, that's, that's number one. Number two, if we want to change society, we want to change what's going on, um, do something kind for somebody else that does not look like you. It's, it's, I, I wish the world was this simple, but I tell my clients the same thing. The legacy in our name comes from leave the world a little better than we found it, right? I didn't really come with too much, but if I could leave the world a little better than I found it with at least $1, at least that's compound interest on a dollar, right? So, so if we can do that, with somebody that does not look like us, guess what that does? That that increases the the kindness that's going on. That that then lowers the tension that's happening with certain cultures. Just random, like just 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 do something kind for somebody that doesn't look like you. What about that? <laughs> I don't know. Seems pretty simplistic, right? Um, but some of these things are so simple. My coach used to say they're so simple, they work so good, you stop doing them. Right. So, so I think we've, we've lost that, 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 uh, that compassion for the human spirit and the human soul for each other. I, I do believe that, unfortunately. Um, uh, number, number three is if you're doing business with, with minority individuals, you have to listen. I think people have to listen more to, to their plight, where they came from, their understanding. Because remember that if you're having a financial conversation, conversation, we only know what we were taught or what we observed from our parents. So if that was the first generation of wealth, you know, minority professionals that I work with on a regular basis, I'll challenge them. I'll say, what did your parents teach you about wealth? And the understanding is that you, when you start to understand how minorities, African Americans specifically, learned about wealth, you can't have the conversation here if they're here because their comprehension of the conversation is different. And so that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the key things um, as you, as, you know, for African-American professionals, if you're going to work with them, hire them, work with them, just understand their plight, where they came from. Um, the other thing is, 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 is I think you got to reach across party lines because parties don't exist when you have races. It just doesn't, right? And you got to reach across that and say, hey, you could be Republican, you could be independent, you could be whatever you may be for the greater good of mankind. Let's figure out how we can do this and make this world better. And the last one, which is phenomenal, is there's a golden rule. Treat others like you wanna be treated. I got one even better for you, Doc, you ready? I want everybody on this podcast to write this down. Don't just treat everybody how you wanna be treated, treat them how you want your children to be treated. Because if you treat them how you want your children to be treated, I'll guarantee you there's not a person listening to this podcast today that would say, I want my kid treated like anything but excellent. Right. It takes a village to raise children. Right. So if you my kids at your house, I want you to treat him like your kid. Right. Right. Don't abuse him. Don't not feed him. Things like that. But treat him like your kid as if you would love and care for him if he was yours. Right. So I think that is if we treat people like we would want our children to be treated, that is kind, that is patient, that is all those wonderful words that allow for us to, to get back to, like I said, the reset of kindness and humanity and uplifting and supporting each other and going beyond the, 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 the racial divide or racial differences that, that, that make us, that make society a little difficult at this current time. And maybe it's exponentially more, more, you know, onus on it because of COVID, but it's been underlying, I think for a while. So it's good that we we're open to having conversations and, and doing business with others that even doing business with others that don't look like us. Why not? There's no downside to it. Why not? Chris, um, we, I, we need a fancy name for that besides the Chris Gandy rule. I don't know what we call it. The diamond rule, the Chris Gandy diamond. Rule, I don't know what it's called, but I, I love that. Um, treat people how you'd want your children to be treated. Yeah. I love that. So you're going to, that just, I mean, it touches you when you say it, you're like, yeah, you know, yeah, what that it is. makes it's perfect. Kind of, that's kind of yeah. Perfect sense. Yeah, totally. Stuff. So we need it. We need a fancy name for it um, that you can coin. Um, Chris, I have a couple last questions. Um, before I ask them, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your time and your, 
your, um, your expertise. And I want to encourage people to check out what Chris is doing. Um, you can go to MidwestLegacyGroupLLC.com. Um, and there's numerous articles he's been featured in um, and spoken in numerous groups. But you could start there and check out MidwestLegacyGroupLLC.com. Um, anywhere else, Chris, we should point people towards online. Or is that the best? Well, one? I think that the big thing is just just Google me, right? I think if you Google me, you'll see a bunch of a bunch of things that we're doing. Um, you know, with the help of uh, of you, we're going to be launching some fantastic content into the marketplace. So pay attention to that. Um, you also can find us on uh, some social media outlets at uh, Midwest Legacy Group um, on uh, Facebook and on on uh, LinkedIn and on um, Instagram, if you're an Instagrammer, but you know, I, I would, I would simply say, Hey, keep your eyes peeled. We're coming out with some good stuff. We are, we are on the forefront right now of really speaking to the media because in our industry, there's just not a lot of minority uh, owners and um, uh, leaders within the industry. Um, so we're bending the ear of, 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 of insurance companies, risk management companies, asset protection companies, and investment companies to just change the narrative. I think the narrative has to be changed for us to, 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 to all be able to excel. Um, you know, survive is one thing, but to excel and exceed, um, I think we have to have the opportunity to, do it, the opportunity to do that and the opportunity to continue to learn from each other. I think there's so much knowledge out here. Um, the abundance mentality is where we have to live going forward if we expect to kind of transcend where we are today. Chris, thanks. Everyone check it out, MidwestLegacyGroupLLC.com. This, you know, the interview will not be complete, Chris, without you, some of your favorite MBA stories. You know, <laughs> if you think about it, there's, there's children, kids all over the U.S., all over the world, who are you know out in the playground playing basketball, and their dream is to go to the NBA. Their dream is to play college basketball or go to the NBA. And I'd love for you to talk about just a few of your favorite NBA stories, and then um, I may follow up with a question or two. Okay, um, well, I can give you a couple that. Um, uh, let's see, some I can talk about. Let's see here. Okay, cool. So I think the one that kind of stands out to me was um, uh, there's a couple when I was here in Chicago. So in 1987, I was uh, picked up as a free agent here with the Bulls. I signed a free agent contract. Um, if you go back and look at the history, uh, it was the same year that uh, Keith Booth was picked from Maryland. Uh, the Bulls had a second round pick. They had, uh, they had already traded away the first round pick. And uh, they ended up picking up Keith Booth. Actually, Keith Booth was the end of the first round, and then they didn't have a second round. So they only actually ended up picking up one guy. Same year, Rusty LaRue, too. So I think Rusty kind of was the last pick or something like that. But, you know, typically a team will have eight to ten guys that they, uh, they bring in, and uh, probably half those guys, probably 70% of those guys make it, and any other part become part of the practice squad, and then they maybe they'll play one or two. Um, I was one of the guys that they brought in with the hopes that I'd make the practice squad, and, you know, I did that. And, um, you know, every now and again, I get a chance to dress, and they on and off injury reserve. Most people don't understand how it works, but the people on injury reserve aren't necessarily injured, right? You can only have so many people on the active roster, so you bring the other people just for the purpose of if somebody gets hurt, you can actually bring somebody else in, put them in the locker room. So, uh, but we used to go to practice every day, and every day, as you probably know, in 1997, uh, Jordan Pippen, Robin, all those guys, right? And, and it was kind of a cool thing. Um, but I remember the first day I walked into practice, um, all the rookies were there, Rook, 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 you're, that's what your name, you don't actually have a name on your jersey, your actual <laughs> name is Rook, right? And Rook from Illinois, Rook, whatever, they come up with names for you, which is kind of cool. Um, but I remember sitting there and um, uh, the first day that we had workouts with the vets, so you got invited back to vet camp. Well, I got invited back to vet camp. I went in just like I did because the rookie had rookie camp. You went into vet camp, and I just remember sitting there at vet camp, and I remember that walking in, and I, they were like, hey, you guys are down there. And so basically think of like little small high school lockers down in one end, and then you got these big, huge 
um, basically uh, million dollar lockers that uh, are over here and they're like Jordan's got one wing and Pippen's got another one and you know all, everyone else and then there's us right and I remember um, I remember calling my calling my friend after practice that day and I called him up and I said hey I said um, guess where I'm at he's like I have no idea and my, you know my friend is one of those guys that is never impressed by fame because he just doesn't care right he's that guy so I call him up and I said, guess where I'm at? He said, uh, uh, in camp somewhere. I don't know. Where are you? I go, I'm in Chicago. He goes, oh, how's the weather up there? I go, no, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the Bulls camp. He's like, oh, cool. He goes, he goes, uh, how's it going? I go, I just got done playing against Michael Jordan click and I hung up on him. <laughs> right. Because, uh, you know, it's always a childhood. You know, I mean, growing up, you know, you got a chance to watch him play and mature. I mean, you're just kind of like, yeah, if I ever get a chance to play against that guy, how wonderful would that be, right? Um, so that was just kind of a humbling experience for, for me as a kid um, to get a chance to kind of see those guys, but also get a chance to get to know those guys and kind of humanize with them. Um, they live and eat and breathe the same air we do. They don't walk on water. They're nice people. They have kids. They have families. And guess what? If you treat them like a normal human being and not like a celebrity, they'll respect you much more. So um, I just treat them like normal guys. Same way I treat my guys now. I have, I have guys now where um, we help them organize their financial affairs and they're in the NBA, Major League Baseball, um, hockey. We got, I think, tennis, uh, um, international basketball, football, NFL. Um, so we got a bunch of players where we kind of help them do that. Um, let me see. Is there another story? What, that's, what that's sticks out? Talking? Does anything stick out from those practices, whether it's from uh, Phil Jackson or Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen? What sticks out? Did anyone give any specific advice, feedback, or did you just uh, observe anything? Uh, no, I, I mean, just – I think everybody wants to know about Michael Jordan because that's just, but the hardest working man on that team was actually Dennis Rodman. Um, but I mean the hardest working person, uh, he just was intense all the time when he was there, right? He would work out, he would work out two to three hours before practice, go practice and then work out two to three hours after practice, every practice, like full blown practice, full blown workouts. And you're like, you just got done working. working. But he really was, an actual quintessential of and a cornerstone of that team. And you saw it on the floor, but you don't know the amount of work that guy did. Everybody talks about, I saw the last dance and I saw they kind of portrayed him as a guy that was unfocused. And yes, he was all that, but when he was there, there was nobody like him. I mean, he just literally, and he was, he was nice. He was kind to all everybody. I mean, he, he really went out his way to help other people. Um, he wasn't the persona, and I think that was that's part of what the narrative that TV gives us is the persona of what what people are versus who they really are as a person. I always tell people I'm not a basketball player. My name I'm Chris Candy. Even when I was playing basketball, they were like, "Nice." To, I've always wanted to meet a basketball player. I'm like, "I'm nice to meet you." My name's Chris Candy, right? Let me tell you something about me because basketball is not who I am. Basketball is what I do. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so, so I, I've always tried to, 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 to tell people and help people understand that just because you see someone that way or that you, they get acknowledgement because of what they do, that's not who they are. Um, so that's, 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 that's what I'll tell someone if they run into, like, if you see somebody, you know, and they're you know, a superstar or something, or you've seen them on TV at the end of the day, if they're out having dinner with their spouse or their wife, at the end of the day, just leave them alone. I mean, I don't, there's normal people in society. They just happen to be gifted at a, at a single thing. And so they deserve their privacy just like everybody else. Yeah. I know, Chris, for you, you are about work ethic. You're about, you know, competitiveness, doing your best. Who else sticks out like the Dennis Rodman who had – you know, behind the scenes, you don't see behind the scenes. You don't see all the, you know, the work ethic and the hours and hours and hours people put in. Who else sticks out to you from that team or maybe the Spurs or somewhere else that, like, wow, these people, this person had an unbelievable work ethic that you just don't see? Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple people that kind of stick out to me that 
would I say that, that, that their, their effort, their effort made their, their skill look way better than it was. Right. Um, I go back to college, um, Brian Johnson and Lucas Johnson. I think they're from Chicago, Des Plaines, you know, those guys, were they okay basketball players? Sure. Matt Hellman, you know, Matt Hellman that played at Illinois, same thing. Were they good basketball players? Yes. Were they talented basketball players? Yes. Um, but were they great basketball players? No. They were good basketball players, but were they great basketball players? No, not at all. But they got more out of what their skill set was. And there was not, there's always been people that have more in the skill set that can't get it out of there. And those guys were – we're just super, super, super talented. I mean, I think Tim Duncan had both, right? Tim Duncan, I, don't, I didn't see too many kids growing up saying, I want to be Tim Duncan when I grow up. I want to be Manu Ginobili when I grow up. I want to be Tony Parker. I, I didn't see that. But if you look at how many championships those guys won, you see, look at that. They, they were the ones that were beating Shaq and Kobe. They were the ones that were beating consistently. They were the ones that were beating um, LeBron James and the Miami Heat. They were the ones that were beating those teams consistently. They were putting them out every single year. And it was like, who's going to beat the Spurs? Well, none of them were flashy. None of them were, were guys that you, you would say, hey, that's the top three guys that ever play in the NBA. You would say they're all a bunch of role players, right? And so um, until they got Kawhi Leonard. But they had enough of the – they were able to, to, to actually work hard enough to, in a system to put their personality aside – to put others' needs before their own, and they were able to win. So what was more important, winning, being successful, or being a superstar? So, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of see, who, you know, what's more important. And I think Tim Duncan had, had both, right? He was an all-star year after year after year after year. Like, how? But he was just, he was just that guy, right? The guys just, just go, go to work, right? Um, he's a guy you hate to play against and love to have on your team. Do you, you want people like that? You know, Chris, what I love about what you talk about is you talk a lot about mindset and you bring that competitive, hardworking mindset with the clients that you work with, the executives you work with, the athletes you work with. So I'm wondering, um, when you go into a practice, you're competing against Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan, whoever, what's the mindset you go into? What are you thinking when you're going into competing with some of the best in the world? Me? Yeah, you. Yeah, like you're going in, you're like, I'm going to be guarding Michael Jordan today. I'm maybe guarding Scottie Pippen today. What's your mindset going into to that? Well, I have two different mindsets. I have two things on my mind, right? Number one, I don't care who you are. You put your shoes on the same way I do, so let's get after it, right? So, so I'm, um, I'm the guy, regardless of who I'm talking to, so I'll relate it in my everyday world, right, is – you're a stranger until I meet you for the first time. Everybody's a stranger until they meet someone for the first time. Then they're no longer a stranger. So how can you tell me I don't want to do business with you or I, I have no idea what you do if you don't, if you and I have never had a conversation, right? So, 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 so I, I, if I'm relating it to sports, um, it's, it's if I'm playing against a or guarding a guy like Michael Jordan, right? It's simply a couple things. One, he gonna remember. He gonna remember I was guarding, right? So if that means I gotta foul him, if that means I got, I'm going hard at him, right? Because that's just what 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 I do, right? If 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 you're gonna go, I'm gonna go to, right? I may not be as talented as you, but we're gonna get after it, right? And um, so so there's that. And then number two was 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 simply if you can do it, I can do it. I, I have that mentality now. If you can do it, I can do it. If there's somebody can do it, I can do it. If there's nobody doing it, then I'm going to do it because I'm going to be the first to do it, right? And that's, that's kind of my mindset. So, so fear for me is secondary to the uncertainty of, of, of the why. My why is that I, there's so many people out here that's never heard our message. If they've never heard our, our message, they're a stranger to us. So I haven't given them the opportunity to have the, the legacy experience. Right. And if they've never had that opportunity, that means we're a stranger. So why not give them the opportunity? And one day in the future, if they're considering some of the services and resources that we provide, then hopefully they think about us and consider us and say, maybe that'll be a different experience. for me. Love it. I want to be the first one to thank you, Chris. 
Check out Midwest Legacy Group LLC.com <laughs> and check it out. Check out what Chris and his team are doing. And thank you so much, Chris. Anytime, anytime. Love to have, love to come back and talk, talk about uh, all types of kind of cool stuff. Anything relating to sports and next level performance, uh, mental mindset, and uh, um, or just the reset right? Perspective, right? And uh, where do you go from here? So uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, God bless. Have a good night. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.